Welcome everybody to the Myrna Method live stream where I try to bring you the most impactful nutrition information that you can use immediately to change your life. So I don't want to just bring you a bunch of information because you know what? We got a ton of it out there. I want to get down and dirty, give you something that you walk out with and go, yep, I can use it now. I understand it and have it be truly impactful. Tonight, we're going to talk about fiber. And I've said I could talk about fiber for like weeks on end because fiber is one of those compounds that's in a lot, most foods, okay, for many foods. And it has so many different properties and does so many things. And we are really getting information on the gut microbiome and how it affects diseases, how it travels. I mean, we are learning so much about the gut and its implication in diseases, even dementia cardiovascular disease, it seems as if everything starts in the gut. I also am going to bring to you guys tonight a little bit of the GLP-1, which is that Ohola, Zempia, and those drugs that are used now for appetite, well, I can't say appetite suppression, it's really more for appetite control, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the science on that. So let's get right down dirty and let's talk about how fiber significantly, let me make sure I've done everything here technology-wise. Looks like I'm good. All right. So when we're looking at this, hold on a minute, guys. i got to make sure you're looking at this. All right, there we go. So why fiber is the magic bullet to weight loss? And a lot of people know, yeah, I just do fiber because, you know, it makes me feel good. But there is some real chemical magic that goes on. So I want to explain that to you tonight and bring you studies that back it up. Because when I looked at designing the Holy Grail, and I mean the Holy Grail in obesity, it was about finding a perfect mixture of macronutrients, mixture of foods. What was it? Is it was it going to be a vegan diet? Was it going to be a paleo diet? Nope. It was about understanding chemical balance. And part of that chemical balance that's so important is understanding that the gut bacteria, what happens in the gut, is huge in appetite suppression. It's huge in weight control. There's so many things that go on in the gut that it makes a corner in the box when I talk about the Myrna method, because it is part of the Holy Grail. So even if you get the muscles right, you know, you get the carbs right, you do the protein right, maybe you're doing the insulin right. But if you're not getting the gut right, those are the three main things you'll be working from the brain chemicals. And the brain chemicals are where you're into that full addiction. You're eating from that hedonic state of food, you know, it just can't stop or you just can't seem to get rid of the palate. There is a scientific explanation behind everything that deals with food and food addiction. So if we're shooting up these drugs, right, for $1,200 to $1,500 a month to control our appetite because that's how desperate people become or they're doing surgeries to remove half their stomach. People are desperate out there. And I'm going to show you that similar to the drug, food can have the same effect. It can literally do what the drug does without the side effects. And one of the biggest magic bullets in doing that is fiber. So when we look at the whole deal with food addiction, that's really why people gain the weight. It isn't that people don't really understand that I shouldn't eat this or I shouldn't eat that. They know that, especially if they've been on half a dozen diets. They already know what food they should and shouldn't eat. Okay, It has to do with the chemical type of impulse, people will say it's a drive, it's, it's a craving, lack of willpower. But really what's going on is it's an imbalance that creates this feedback loop that just keeps you diving into the candy jar, diving into the bag of chips. So let's talk about the GLP, glucagon-like peptides. Peptides are just a bunch of amino acids that are all clumped together. And these peptides can have hormone-like properties. What's really unique about the body, and I think that's really cool, 
when it comes down to proteins, is that when you eat a protein like a bean or maybe you eat a piece of chicken, you're eating protein food, that protein food breaks down to amino acids and those amino acids get into the cell and from there, it creates every single thing about you. And one of the things that proteins create are these peptides. And when we think about peptides, we think about amino acids that are clumped together, but the difference is that they have hormone-like action. And the biggest one that's making the news lately are these GLPs. So let's talk about how they work. So you have a system in your intestinal tract called the incretin system. And these are little receptors that sit on the lining of your intestinal tract. And it's really a hormonal. I mean, we can honestly say that the intestinal tract is like an endocrine gland. It's almost, it almost has its own system of hormones, and this is an example of it. As soon as food comes into the intestinal tract and lays upon this system, this hormonal system, this incretin system, it releases these proteins called GLP-1 gluten-like peptides. And these hormones circulate in the blood and they latch onto receptor sites. Some of those receptor sites they latch onto are in the brain, specifically up in the appetite control center. But we now have drugs that are these ozempic drugs and some of these drugs that we're doing out there that is designed for diabetes but now people are using it for appetite control because these peptides rest upon those receptor sites in the brain and they literally affect the appetite. They make it where you really don't want to eat. And they also rest on receptor sites in the gut and they have the same effect of slowing down gastric emptying. So when we think of these GLP proteins, these peptides, they suppress the release of something called, uh, they suppress the release of glucose from the le liver because they suppress something called glucagon. And this particular horm hormone is what gets released when you're really hungry. So when you're super hungry, or let's say you've been fasting and your stomach's growling, this hormone is released and it tells the liver to dump sugar in your blood because you're hungry. So what happens there is when this GLP begins to circulate, it suppresses the release of this glucagon. It says, hey, don't be circulating in the plasma. Do not be in that blood because we don't want the liver to release glucose. So this peptide actually helps in not letting the liver release sugar like it normally might if you were hungry. We're going to go back to insulin resistance because when you have insulin resistance, you can be in a situation where you're automatically releasing more insulin, which makes you hungrier. So right away, if I am suppressing glucagon, then I am suppressing hunger in a sort of way because I'm not allowing the liver to release the glucose in the blood. So let's go back to the whole biochemistry so we can think about it from a scientific way. When you have the liver that's releasing sugar into the blood, and the liver will do that. The liver releases sugar into the blood if you're super stressed, and that's so the muscles can use the sugar to run with. In this case, also, we talked about glucagon in this particular case. When I talk about your getting that hunger and your stomach's growling, you have all these hormones that are being released. This is one that's being released and it tells the liver to release sugar in the blood. So the liver pays attention and it releases sugar into the blood. And this can actually cause a problem if you have insulin resistance, because we'll go back to this, which is what makes it kind of difficult with diabetics, because it's hard sometimes to regulate their sugar. They can get stressed out and their sugar raises because that liver dumps the sugar in the blood. They can have a situation where actually even when they're hungry and they're getting high sugars, it's hard for them to regulate the sugar because you've got the liver really playing with this sugar release. So what particularly happens in this case, which is what increases the hunger, as soon as you release sugar into the blood, the body releases insulin. 
And whenever you have insulin in the blood, you're hungry. You just got to remember that. If you have a lot of insulin in the blood, you're going to have a lot of hunger. Insulin triggers more sugar, which is why it makes one of my addiction boxes in the Myrna Method. Because if you don't know how to eat to control sugar, you're going to have a raging appetite. Not that you necessarily need more fuel. You could not need more fuel at all. You could have eaten something that was very sugary, and it just continues to where you want more sugar. So in this particular case, when you have the GLP-1, this peptide shuts down the glucagon, so that means less sugar is going to be released from the liver, which means you have less insulin, which really, in some ways, controls your appetite. If you have less sugar releasing glucose in the blood, you have less appetite, which is why I'm so <laughs> doggone pushing the whole idea about we've got to balance the sugars. We can't just eat carbs when we want to. we got to balance them because we don't want insulin raging in the blood because you didn't know how to eat carbs. The other thing that can happen as you become insulin resistant, and that's where this receptor site becomes all clogged up with fat because we know it's excess fatty acids that cause the diabetes insulin resistance. So insulin resistance is diabetes a decade before you get diagnosed. These receptor sites become clogged with fat and it increases the insulin because the body then becomes more demanding, more demanding for insulin because you can't get sugar inside that muscle cell. When you can't get sugar inside the muscle cell because the insulin no longer is able to communicate to bring that transporter up through the cell membrane and the sugar begins to accumulate, the insulin accumulates, and you full, fall into the addiction of wanting more and more of what you're eating, which is more sugar or carbs. The other thing that can happen is you just begin to get a raging appetite. That's why a lot of times when people have insulin resistance, they find they're snacking all the time. They're like, wow, you know, it's like I finished breakfast and two hours later I'm hungry again. When you begin to balance, like what I'm suggesting in the Myrna Method, your appetite really gets regulated. You find you just don't need to eat that much. People tell me, it's amazing, I'm down to my high school weight because I find I don't have that raging appetite because we controlled all the areas we needed to control. So by figuring out how we increase more GLP into our bloodstream is going to definitely affect our appetite in a positive way. So let's go back to talking about the drugs. The drugs are an analog. They're not the real deal. Okay. So that means they made them in the laboratory and they are not the glucagon like peptide. And that's really important for you to understand that because when you take a drug that's a synthetic, it causes side effects. So the question is, can we increase GLP in our bloodstream naturally? And the answer is yes, absolutely. What are the biggest releasers of that? Are protein and fiber. So let me find the, the uh, slide that talks about the protein and fiber. When we're looking at, I can't find it. It's somewhere in here. I'll probably have to go through it and figure it out. But anyways, so these glucagon-like peptides in this particular study, it talks about how, the, how they suppress hunger because we have these receptor sites up in the brain. So once these glucagon uh, peptides begin to circulate in the blood, they begin to block these, they begin to sit on these receptor sites in the brain that block the appetite, that actually decrease our appetite. They also sit on receptor sites in the gut and they slow down gastric emptying, which means that you feel fuller longer. So it isn't just about having a lot of fiber food. I mean, sure, that creates bulk and we can feel full with it. It does more than that. It actually creates chemicals that can, these GLP peptides, that can make you feel full. They sit on receptor sites. They give that full feeling. And 
obviously the other thing they do is affect the appetite in the brain. So what these peptides do is they tell the glucose to not release the sugar, which means you're not going to have the insulin release, which means that's a control for appetite right there. It makes you feel more full because that's what these GLPs do. They sit on receptor sites. They give you a more satiety feeling. And then the other thing is they sit on receptor sites in the brain that literally control your appetite. These analogs, the drugs that people are taking that they're injecting, the reason why they can't swallow them is because they're peptides, they're proteins. So as soon as they hit the stomach, they all get all dissolved. So that's why they have to inject them in the bloodstream. But bottom line, that's what this drug is doing, but it's a synthetic. It's made in a laboratory. And there have been side effects that they're finding through that. Um, pancreatitis, they find that they're getting thyroid tumors or some of the side effects that they find with this gastrointestinal issues, some of the gastric emptying, some of the things that they're doing in the gut. So, and also there's also been some studies regarding depression and behavior, because remember it's sitting up in some of those neuronal cell cells in the brain. Bottom line, we want to figure out how to do this all naturally. If you look at this study, it's more information about um, overweight individuals and they're getting this mixed macronutrient diet. And when they increase their protein, they can actually increase a higher level of GLPs. Two things increase GLPs naturally, protein and fiber. Whoa, where did we hear that one before? So protein and fiber definitely affect the hormonal system in your gut that has an appetite regulatory pathology. So that's why when I talk about my program and I talk about the importance of using protein and fiber to not only balance things at the meal, it also has a huge chemical composite too that actually chemically affect these areas. So when we look at creating this natural appetite suppressant, what we're looking at, oh, here's a, here's a study on some of these drug analogs, which means they're synthetically made in the laboratory, and the risk for pancreatitis, thyroid tumors, and also they have shown that there's a greater loss of lean muscle mass. That's a big problem. So these are just some of the things they're seeing with some of these medications that are these GLP. Because remember, they're not the real deal. They're not the real deal. They're a drug that are simulating what a GLP would do. So what I'm saying is why are we not figuring out how to get to the real deal? And the way we're going to get to the real deal is understanding that that is going to require a good amount of fiber. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. The fact that fiber actually has certain chemicals that affect neuronal cells in the brain, have chemicals that actually affect the gut. I'm not talking about, I just ate a bunch of broccoli and I'm feeling full now. I'm talking about satiety chemically that can actually contribute to a chemical reduction or desire for food. And this is what I'm talking about when I say we can balance your diet in such a way that we can turn off the switches. Now, of course, it's meal to meal. That's what I tell people. You can't just eat one meal like this and then two meals later think you can go back to eating any, any way you want. No, it's, it's chemical. It's a meal to meal deal. Okay. So when we're looking at some this this talks this study here talks about dietary fibers prevent obesity through the reduction of hunger and they increase the uh, satiety so this talks about how these fibers stimulate brain the through the fermentation problems process, they can get up into the regions of the brain and actually regulate the appetite and ultimately reduce food intake. So this is about reducing food intake through chemicals, through foods. Okay. So let's go on and look at what we mean when we say the GLPs. So these glucon 
glucagon-like peptides, GLPs, is a gut hormone which directly binds to the GLP receptor sites locating, number one, at the surface of the pancreatic cells in the pancreas. Also, they're in the brain cells. We have them in the gut. These are all the areas that these GLPs attach to and chemically reduce your desire to want to eat more food. That's huge. So that's what I'm saying, that fiber is like a magic bullet for weight loss. Now, let's say you're doing a lot of fiber, but you're not paying attention to the muscles and you're not paying attention to the insulin. And now you understand why, to me, it's important that you got to do all of this for balancing. But to the simple fact that fiber alone has this type of magic bullet effect, to me, is huge, okay? So these neuronal cells in the brain, these GLP receptors, um, go to the hypothalamus, that's up in the brain, and they are involved in the central control of energy homeostasis, and this is huge for the drug Ozempia, these drugs on the market, because these GLPs that they're synthet synthetically taking still can log on to those receptors. So it also, these GLPs I want to talk about up here, um, they also are very uh, instrumental in uh, cardiovascular functions. They help with glucose production. We'll talk a little bit about that. Artery blood flow. So these GLPs that are circulating in your blood are not just about decreasing your appetite, they also have a cardiovascular benefit. They have a vascular benefit. And that to me is pretty interesting. So again, when I go back to fiber, I'm like, look, it's if I have people that have cardiovascular disease, they have stents, they're not doing so great. I'm like, look, fiber is your best friend. You Got to bring the fiber in because of the chemicals that it does for the arteries. In this case, it attaches to certain receptor sites in the pancreas. It helps with better function of the insulin for the pancreas. So these peptides and why they created a drug for it, right, are huge and instrumental in doing many things besides just controlling your appetite. So when we talk about fiber, we can't forget about the good bacteria, the bad bacteria, and also what's called short-chain fatty acids. These are also instrumental in health and also for appetite control. What happens when you eat fiber foods is they ferment in the gut, and this can take certain bacteria enzymes. A lot of times if you're increasing your diet with more fiber than you're accustomed to, you might need a digestive enzyme because sometimes you may not have all the enzymes if you're up in your fiber from like... 10 grams to 40 grams, you could feel a little bloated and distended. So it takes a while for your body to build up the bacterias to start breaking down these fibers comfortably. But what happens is as it breaks down these fibers, it forms compounds called short chain fatty acids. Now they're not fats. You've heard me say this before. They're shorter chains, so they don't have the same kind of properties that we normally think of with fats. So these are not going to do anything as far as clogging up a receptor site for diabetes, none of that, none of that. These are actually really good, these short-chain fatty acids. But there's receptor sites for short-chain fatty acids also in the hypothalamus of the brain. So we have neuronal cells in the brain that have receptor sites for GLP peptides, they control the appetite, and also for short-chain fatty acids. So there's another benefit. It's like a double whammy for appetite control. Also, these good bacteria that are in the gut are what keep the balance there. So if you have a big mess gut bacteria and you're not eating some of these fibers, what can happen is you can have what's called gut dysbiosis, where you have a higher percentage of bad bacteria to good bacteria. Your digestive enzymes don't work as well because these bad bacteria actually can destroy the function of digestive enzymes, but they also create an environment that you don't have the short-chain fatty acid maximum production. So foods that create the bad bacteria, a lot of sugar and a lot of fats, so this can actually 
have you not have any appetite control. So when you have less fiber in your diet, you're going to tend to eat more because you have nothing that's turning off the switch. Not to mention, as if it doesn't get worse, these bad bacteria that reside in the gut because we're not training our body to eat the good bacteria, they begin to change the palate. And this is crazy. The bad bacteria can actually go in the brain and change your desire for foods that are good for you. The foods that would actually turn the appetite switches off, you have now no way of turning switches off. You're riding high and you're, the food is flowing and you have no way of really regulating it. That's why if you're not balancing, I say you have really poor appetite regulation, right? The big kickers are getting the muscles and what they need, the insulin, that hormone, and the gut bacteria, we've got to get this under control. Because if we don't get the right gut bacteria in there, these bad bacterias can actually get your brain to want more of the bad foods. And it's more of a palate changer. It's not that you're binging on a bag of chips. It's that you don't like the taste of broccoli. It's crazy that you just can't tolerate vegetables. And I have people tell me, oh, I just can't eat those. I don't like them. I'm like, I know. You got to train yourself to like them, unfortunately. And it can take six to eight weeks. You got to get off those other foods. Let that bacteria get cleaned up. Get the good bacteria in. And then the opposite happens. Then the good bacteria manipulate your brain and you find a palate for all these good foods. It's kind of crazy how that works. So to me, fiber is huge and really instrumental. And there's many studies that talk about how this gut bacteria can even affect the brain from a behavior standpoint, not just from an appetite regulatory, but from a depression and anxiety so that they're finding that these bacteria, these bad ones, actually can change your mood. So that is, to me, crazy science. And, and by the way, guys, a lot of this has just come out probably in the last decade. So a lot of physicians may not be keeping up with some of this. They're maybe not fully aware of it, but there's so much research right now that's surfacing. That's why I love talking about the gut, because every time I open up studies, there's more stuff about what the gut's doing, whether it's related to rheumatoid arthritis or any type of autoimmune disease. They're now saying, hey, we think some of this may be starting in the gut. So these gut bacteria are implicated when they travel through the body. They can cause all kinds of issues there. They can also affect the brainstem and they can change your palate for, for eating the very foods you're trying to not eat so you can have some kind of regulatory system. So as far as understanding truly what fiber does, to me, it does a couple things. It creates these hormones, the uh, GLP, the short-chain fatty acids. These also um, travel and affect the appetite. It creates good bacteria that change the palate, okay? These are all separate, guys. These are all separate uh, entities on their own that can affect the appetite in a positive way. And then the other thing that fiber does, it helps clean the colon. And there's different types of fibers. And we want to talk about those different types and how they affect your health and how they affect your gut. So let's get into those type of fibers. I think, let me see if I have some other studies. Okay, this one, before we go on to that, this talks about the control of appetite and energy intake by short-chain fatty acids. There we go. We just explained it. And these are huge in getting into the brain cells and sitting on those receptor sites and literally affecting the appetite. And totally separate than the GLP peptides, totally separate than the good bacteria. So this is more ammunition where my statement that fiber is the magic bullet for weight loss, boy, oh boy, do I mean that, right? Because we know muscles, that's just a little brain thing. If the muscles don't get enough carbohydrates, 
they tell the brain to eat more carbs. Okay, that's pretty simple. You've got the hormone insulin, and if you don't regulate those carbs, you can have a lot of glucose in the blood and get a lot of insulin, and then you find that you're hungry all the time. But come on, folks. Fiber's got some major hit points on appetite, major hit points. I think it scores higher than the other two by far, okay? But don't get me wrong. You still got to balance all of them to get the full effect. So when we're looking at these short-chain fatty acids, they also have receptors. There's also receptor sites on immune cells for short-chain fatty acids. So not only do they control the appetite, but they also make an immune cell more powerful in its anti-inflammatory process. Short-chain fatty acids that circulate and they're in healthy amounts have shown to re reduce inflammation and reduce vascular disease. Yeah, where are they coming from? Fiber. So to me, fiber is a magic bullet, a magic bullet. Now, just to tell somebody to eat fiber, once again, you got to understand how to eat in general. Although I do believe that when you throw in fiber in somebody's diet, they do have some magic happen. You'll find that they, you know, kind of do start losing weight because of the processes in the fiber fermenting and all the positive things that happen because of the processes of fiber, what it goes through to, to be digested, to be fermented, what it, when it hits the uh, system in the gut and creates these peptides, all these positive things that fiber does. So um, this talks again about short-chain fatty acids from the gut microbiota and the gut-brain communication. Once again, more studies that say, yeah, these short-chain fatty acids literally communicate to the brain and they control your appetite. Short-chain fatty acids are from fibers that are fermented in your gut. Also, it... Um, it affects the taste, and I think this study here talks about how the bacteria in the gut, uh, further bacteria in the highlighted area, um, interact with specialized receptor cells expressed by the lining in the gut that can lead to taste and appetite response changes to these nutrients. This review describes recent advances on the role of the gut bacteria in taste perception and functions. What happens in this case, guys, is these gut bacterias that can affect our taste change our palate. So we just tend to not like certain foods and we think it's just because we don't like certain foods. Okay, but you can train yourself to not like them, unlike them, and like other foods because it's happening in the gut. This is where all it's coming. A lot of people think, no, no, isn't it just my preference? Didn't I just grow up on that? Okay, I'll give you a little bit of that. But mostly, honestly, it's as simple as the chemistry in the gut. That's what's going on. So let's talk about the two fibers and because we're going to talk about the colon and how it cleans it. But the two fibers we have are soluble fibers and insoluble fibers. So when we look at all plant foods, you're going to either have a mix of soluble fibers or insoluble fibers. So let me show you the graph here. And I did a list of some of these so you guys could see. You look at apple with the skin, it has 4.2 soluble fiber and it's got 1.5 insoluble fiber. Total fiber, 5.7. If you look at a banana, it's got 2.1 soluble fiber and it's got 0.7 insoluble fiber. So when you look at plant foods, you have two different type of fibers, soluble versus insoluble. So let's understand what that means and what both of them do. So when I'm looking at these different types of fibers, I'm really talking about a colon cleanse. Okay, when I'm looking at the insoluble fibers, well, let me see if I find that slide. There we go. Let's start with the soluble fibers first. These fibers dissolve in water. They form a sludge. It's like Metamucil in a cup. 
It's when you think of um, facillum husk and you mix it in your foods and you find it's kind of gooey or beans. You cook beans and it creates kind of a gooey or oatmeal. These foods are showing their face when it comes to soluble fiber or flax seeds or chia seeds. So chia seeds are really high in soluble fibers. These fibers break down into a gel and this gel lines the intestinal tract and a lot of toxins get all bunched up in that web, that gel, and then the body cleans the gel. You remove it, okay? So you get rid of it as waste. And through that, it removes cholesterols and, and these LDL fats. So this is a really good cholesterol decreaser right here, these soluble fibers. Not to mention when they get fermented, they're controlling your appetite as well. But this is really instrumental in lowering some of those bad cholesterols. So it forms a sludge. It also helps form feces. So with soluble fibers, sometimes it's used for constipation and for diarrhea as well because it creates more of a I want to say sludge, but if you're having diarrhea, it helps kind of create this, forms more of a feces, all right? So it also, I think the biggest claim to fame for soluble fibers, it it is the fibers that actually create the bacteria, the good bacteria. The soluble fibers are the ones that are getting in there and they're creating the probiotics more than the insoluble fibers. We'll come back to the different types. So the insoluble fiber is what we call plant roughage. And this is what we're going to see in bran or bran flakes. Um, when we think of broccoli, it has a lot of insoluble fibers. I always think of broccoli as like a big brush going through the intestinal tract. But these, these insoluble fibers... They actually scrape the walls of the intestinal tract. They get all in there in those crevices because you know that intestinal tract's got tear pin turns, a lot of creases, and these fibers get in there. You got to think of it as a big scrape brush and just pull down the toxins that can get up in those crevices. This is major for being a colon cleanse. That combined with the insoluble fibers. So when you think of the two type of fibers, you have one that's helping create a sludge to trap some of these bad toxins. And then you have another that's scraping down the walls. So when I think about fiber itself and its structure, because this is the structure of fiber, you have one that's a a web, a spider web to hold in those bad fats. And then you got the other one that's scraping down the walls. So fiber is a great cleaner for the intestinal tract. And why is that important? Because you want to keep all these receptor sites open. Remember, these GLP receptor sites sit on a hormonal system sit, called the incretin system. And if that incretin system, if that hormonal system in the gut is all sludged up, right? We've got constipation. We're not moving things out like we should. You're not going to be creating a lot of GP, GLPs, all right? You're not going to get the benefit because you got to keep that colon clean so it can absorb the nutrients better, so it can create these hormones better. So the key with a colon cleanse is to get rid of the bad stuff open up the intestinal tract so that you have access to keeping these areas clean. So when we, let me find that slide again. There we go. So insolubles, big scrape brush. Solubles are the sludge. So let's find the foods that have them. So the different type of soluble fibers are going to be wheat dextrin, the gummy bears, the psyllium husk, inulin. So when you look at a lot of these um, foods that they're putting fiber in. Like I saw yogurt the other day that had like four grams of fiber. So they're definitely putting one of these in. It's like a facillum husk. These are your soluble fibers, really strong fibers to help soak up that cholesterol. These fibers, and let me just give you some example. There's sun fiber. Now this is the one everybody tells me doesn't taste at all. Um, you can add it to food. Some of the others create a real a real gooey texture. This one doesn't. This is what I've been told. I haven't actually tried it myself. A lot of patients love it though, but it's seven grams of fiber for 15 calories. 
So a lot of times what I do with these soluble fibers, because I know it's so good for the cholesterol, is I'm having my patients add it in their foods. Number one, it's helping balance some of their meals because it's one scoop. I think one scoop is like maybe two tablespoons or maybe a tablespoon and a half. It's not a lot. So even by adding a couple teaspoons, I can easily get three to four grams of fiber, which could be enough to just bump your meal up. But the big key is that it's helping with the cholesterol. Let me go to a study where I, and I'll come back to these others. Um, so the amount of soluble fibers where we've seen the biggest increase, I mean, the biggest decrease in these cholesterols and actually improvement in laboratory values um, is as little as five grams. <clears throat> in a lot of studies, I look at six to seven grams. I, I think this study I, I have here is, um, I think it is, yeah, this one talks about five grams, but that's not even a lot. Okay, that's like saying um, a tablespoon of facillum husk. A tablespoon of facillum husk per day added to your food can have some positive effects in soaking up some of those bad cholesterol so they, they can't get into the bloodstream because they're stuck in the soluble fiber. So that's why fiber is advocated with some of these vascular diseases because it really helps not allow those LDL fats to get in the bloodstream. So, um, and some of the clinical trials reflect um, as high as 10 to 20 grams. Will that have effect? Will you have a lot of diarrhea with that? No, not really. Not with the soluble fibers. You shouldn't. Some of the fibers can cause gas and distension, especially if you're not used to it. And I think inulin is the one that I think does that. Some of these sugar alcohols also can do that. So when you look at foods that have fibers, you got to see if they have some sugar alcohols because that can cause some distension, some gut discomfort. But bottom line, let's go back and see. Um, this one here is gar fiber. That's a certain type. So let me show you the different types. Um, these are the different ones you're going to see out in the industry. I think inulin is the one that I tend to think has more gut issues than, than any of the others where you get more distended. But a lot of times when these fibers are added to food, it can create some gas for you. So you got to kind of look at that. But man, they're really good uh, cholesterol reducers. And as little as one tablespoon of soluble fiber, six to seven grams, we've seen clinical studies that show can reduce it. Two tablespoons of that and you're doing amazing, right? So as much as 10 to 20 grams in most of these clinical trials, we see a really strong reduction of these cholesterols. So when we think of what is the magic bullet, um, to me, what I have found is as much as four and a half cups of vegetables a day. Now, when I say that, that freaks people out a little bit because they're going, oh my gosh, that's a, that seems like a lot of cups of vegetables. So with, re, with really increasing your health, right? And in, in trying to get all these things figured out, we're trying to uh, lower our appetite. It, do, it is based on amount and variety. Okay, different varieties and different amounts. They have different chemicals in them that do different things. So what I have found has worked the best for my research and also working with patients is, let me show you guys, because I have a little chart, is three cups of greens. Because what's in the green isn't in the red, yellow, orange. And then all the other, these other colors. So there's things in leafy greens that are a little different than Brussels sprouts or zucchinis. But bottom line, if it's green, you get it in. Green beans, the, the chemicals in, that make the green color are a little different chemicals that are going to make the other colors like the red, orange, yellows. So if you really want to create a kick-butt gut and great health, because we already know these fibers are going to start regulating your appetite. We already know that. But as far as health's concerned and some of the chemicals in these fibers, this right here could be one big salad because you've got one and a half cups 
of leafy greens or one and a half cups of greens. We could just make that three cups of all greens, right? Spinach, or arugula. And then you've got one tomato, one sweet potato, and you're pretty much covered. You've covered this. And then the only other thing I have found makes a huge difference is to add some beans or lentils. And I'm talking half a cup, half a cup. That's not a lot. Most of the time, that's not going to be a problem for most people. Maybe you separate it a little for the cut. Maybe you make some hummus. You do a little bit in the, in the afternoon, and then maybe for dinner, you're doing a little bit more. But bottom line, pretty big. Then we've got some of our grains. And our grains also add some fiber. And grains are going to be mostly insoluble fibers. You'll have some soluble, but you've got to think of bran, a lot of roughage there. They really help clean the gut. That's why you get some of those bran buds, and man, that can regulate you right there because those insoluble fibers, they're scraping and cleaning, which means they're going to give you more of a of a load, okay? You're going to have more feces. They're going to be bigger. They're going to be uh, more mass-like. So... If people are having a lot of constipation, sometimes I might be um, giving them more soluble than insoluble because I don't want to create a lot of mass, right? Because I want to just maybe just move things out with those insoluble fibers. Cardiovascular disease, I'm telling them, man, you got to bring those fibers in, especially the solubles, help lower some of those cholesterols. So let's go back to the PowerPoint and... See if we can do this here. Hold on a minute. There we go. All right. So, yep. Okay, we're on the right one. So let's bring it down to a summary. We're talking about fibers. When we're talking in regards to appetite, we have these peptides that are released when we're eating a lot of protein and fiber. So protein and fiber are the two foods they control your appetite the most, period. Protein releases GLPs. Fiber releases GLPs, short-chain fatty acids, good bacteria as well. But protein and fiber combined are like major appetite controllers, major. Like, yeah, it's starting to make sense, right? So this reduces the appetite in the brain, literally, receptor sites. It delays gastric emptying because there's receptor sites, GLP receptor sites in the intestinal tract that actually control motility. Also, that means you're going to be less hungry and more satisfied because you got more food sitting in there for a little longer. And it also reduces the glucose release from the liver. You don't want the liver releasing a lot of glucose. When you're insulin resistant, that can happen. One of the signs of insulin resistance is people have a lot of insulin release, right? Why is that? Because they're not getting sugar in the muscle like it's supposed to go. So the liver pumps out more, or the uh, pancreas uh, pumps out more insulin, and then the liver responds by pumping out more sugar. It's like this vicious cycle. The other thing that fiber does, it's so awesome, is it ferments in the gut, it creates the short-chain fatty acids, again, another appetite controller, and it creates bacteria, hopefully the good ones from the fiber, the bad ones coming from foods like uh, fat and sugar, which actually creates bad gut bacteria. Either way, it's either good or bad, each one of these manip manipulate the appetite. So when we think about the magic bullet, if I had to just say one magic bullet for weight loss, it's going to have to be fiber. It wins the gold star. Fiber has many reasons why it is an appetite suppressor. When we look at fiber on a food label, where are you going to see it, right? You're going to see that fiber right under those carbohydrates. How many grams of fiber do I think really takes the train wide? all the way home for you, 35 grams. Now, the American Dietetic Association says we like people to have a minimum of 25 grams. What I have found is 35 grams really pretty much hits the ticket, 35 or more. 
Okay. So a lot of people, if they're eating low fiber diet, like I said, you can't just jump up to 35 grams in a week and think everything's going to turn out. Okay. Probably not because you're not used to all that fiber. It might take a while for your body to adjust to it. But fiber is major when it comes to the appetite regulatory system in any one single food. I would say fiber is the one that can make the biggest impact. When we look at regulating the appetite, it's a process. It's not just one thing. Diets aren't just about insulin. It's not just about going low carbs. And that's what everybody's doing. It's, it's, it's about understanding you have got to know how to eat. Fiber is a major part of balancing the system. It is one of the major appetite regulatory foods you can have. Cleans the gut and it creates chemicals that literally control the appetite. So I wanted to leave it open for any kind of questions you guys have. I wanted to also remind you that next week we're going to be doing a different kind of platform. You're going to just click on like you normally do, but we're experimenting. I'm trying to be able to get some of these on so you can share with your friends on Facebook and LinkedIn. So we have to use a different kind of streaming. It's a big learning curve. Thank God I have Samantha because she's working on it. So we will be experimenting next week. But once I get on that and really get situated, um, I want to bring some really good lectures. I want to be able to share it with more people. Uh, and we'll get into some really good science stuff about labs and cool stuff that I can't wait to share with you guys on diet and how we can change our whole body through diet, right? Never have type 2 diabetes or cardiovascular disease. That's the key. Those are dietary diseases and we can fix them. That's hugely important because they're the number one epidemic in our country right now. Okay. So I wanted to leave it open. If anybody has any questions or comments, um, just go ahead and unmute your mic or you can drop it in the chat. Hey, Myrna. So if you're recommending 35 grams of fiber a day, do you recommend a certain amount for just a standard patient, no constipation, nothing, a certain amount of grams of insoluble versus a certain number of grams of soluble? Um, you know, if somebody's having a lot of problems with fiber, I definitely recommend digestive enzymes, right? Because a lot of times they're just not digesting. That's why they can't break it down. But I can tell you that it's fiber is kind of funny because if people have IBS, they're not used to a lot of fiber. It's kind of a problem. So I kind of uh, take it each patient at a time. My goal is to try to get them up to 35 grams, but not a lot of people may not be able to, to tolerate that, right? Um, I would say that I know the American Dietetic Association, they recommend 25 grams minimum. Um, a lot of homeopathics will say 45, you know, they're going to give you more. I, I, don't, I don't really have a clear answer to that question. Um, case by case, that's a clear answer, yeah. Yeah, 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 pretty much. Yeah. So any other questions, guys? Um, I have one, it's Evangeline. Um, this is regarding gut biome, but there's a you know this guy Gundry who talks all about the the gut and all that, um, and how whole wheat. I think he said whole wheat grains make perforations in the gut biome and and create leaky gut. Can you just talk a little bit about uh, that in terms of yeah. factor fiction and because I mean people eat Dave's bread or whole yeah. wheat bread that the cavemen didn't have, of course, but. Yeah. Um, we recommend sourdough if you have to eat bread. But so, can you speak a little bit to that? I tell you what, I would love to. Um, there is a whole science I'm going to bring to the table with you guys on that. Okay. But I am going to tell you this: these lectins that he's referring to, because I know he he's really heavy on lectins. Mm -hmm. Lectins, the body makes lectins. All animals make lectins. They're in plants. Okay, so let's just go there. Your body makes it. 
And they've done a lot of research on lectins not necessarily being bad. We've shown that lectins can actually help with cancer prevention. So certain lectins, I mean, if you eat a bean raw, you can't do that. That's going to make it way too high lectins. But nobody's going to eat a bean raw, right? You cook it. Usually when you cook the lectins from plants, you're going to kill 95% of them. Sure. And the jury's not out yet to say, oh, lectin causes any lesions. And let me tell you the science. And I will, I am, boy, man, I am going to really um, bring a lot to the table regarding the gluten issue. Yes, there is science that you can have gluten and it can the protein in gluten reacts with gut bacteria and this is really key here and mm -hmm. it's going to react with bad gut bacteria and then it's going to create something called zot and the zot is a chemical if you look at the intestinal tract and you look at these epithelial cells in between them, where they're all sewn up, this zot begins to really break down the proteins between those cells, and then you get this opening. Now, what I want to tell you guys is there is a gene marker I'm going to talk about. It's called the haptoglobin gene. We're not going to go there yet because it's pretty. Uh, there's probably one lecture I'll do just on this. Uh -huh. And if you have a certain genetic for that, you create something called zonulin. Now, the gut creates zonulin. Zonulin is made in the liver. Now, zonulin is a very interesting compound because it's created or it was created. The body releases it when there's inflammation. So a lot of people think, wow, when we have zonulin, it's causing the inflammation. But that is not what the studies are showing. And I'm going to bring a lot to the table. We're going to have a lecture. We're just going to talk about heptoglobin. I think that if... I think, truthfully, once I understood this gene, if we're not testing for it, it's borderline malpractice if you have diabetes. Because when you have a certain gene type and you're diabetic, you're going to be 500 to 1,000 times at risk for a heart attack within five years. And this is all in Journal American Medical Association. So there's certain genes I'm bringing to the table. I'm like, listen, guys, you need to get checked for that one. Because... There's a lot of people that have insulin resistance, which is really type 2 diabetes a decade before. You still have a problem with insulin. You still have a problem with glucose. It's just not showing up on the labs. And man, you want to know if you have some of these genes. But why do I mention this? Because if you're this genotype, your body releases a lot of zonulin in the gut. And when you have zonulin in the gut... And you have a lot of bad gut bacteria because you have to have the perfect storm. When you have zonulin, you have bad gut bacteria, and you have gluten, you create this zot. That opens up the lining, period. So if you're this gene type, you're going to be more disposed to have zonulin. If you have zonulin and you have a really clean gut and you're eating perfect or you're not eating all these great foods you're probably not going to have this bad bacteria. But as you age, it doesn't take much to get bad bacteria. As you age, your margins get less and less and less. Mm -hmm. So with my people in their 70s, I see gut bacteria way more than my people in the 50s. They don't have to take, they don't have to fall too far off the path to start seeing so many things because that's what aging is. When you're aging, you got to stay ahead of the curb and you can't just go molly gagging and eating like you used to 10 or 15 years ago, it doesn't work anymore. Your margins go away. I'm not saying that you can't reverse this longevity. I can't, I'm can't. i saying that you can function amazing, but if you're aging, you better get on the train, period. And you better get access to some good information. I like to think on that information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when you get this perfect storm, then yes, you will have what's called leaky gut. It will open up the gut lining. And the bacteria that's sitting in the gut, because it's there, hits the bloodstream much harder than if you have it go out the regular way. Because you can have bacteria go out through the absorption system or it can go out through leaky gut. When it goes out through leaky gut, 
That's where we can see immediate issues with autoimmune diseases. In fact, they really believe some of this contributes to autoimmune diseases. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but you have to have the perfect storm. I mean, I don't buy the fact that everybody who um, eats gluten is going to have issues. I don't see the signs. But I will tell you this. If I have a patient with an autoimmune disease, I'm removing gluten. Why would I not, right? Because I don't know if the cart came before the horse. I'm not sure. So if I'm not sure, I'm going to take a much more conservative approach. The other thing when you look at the gut, let me just show you this, and why a lot of people don't even know they have a gut issue, this being the gut lining. And I'll just draw these cells in the gut. This is like magnified like a million times, right? And the vascular system, the blood system goes up through here and out and up through here and out. So this is your digestive system. This is this is the blood, this is the vascular system. This is the blood that's going up in the lining. It's maybe thicker than that. And it's picking up all the little food nutrients that are getting absorbed and then they're going through the bloodstream. That's how they do it. They do that. So huh? you can have perfect digestion. So you're like, oh yeah, I don't have a gut issue because I feel fine. And you may be fine. Because you're absorbing it like they're supposed to, that's not where the leaky gut's happening. The leaky gut is happening between this. So the leaky gut, so you can be somebody that's, uh, you know, kind of thinking they don't, kind of screw that up there. They don't have a problem when in actuality they may have a problem because this is opening up because they're still absorbing foods. They're still not having any digestion issue because for a while they used to say, oh, leaky gut, you know, I would have a lot of issues. Not necessarily. You could have gluten be a problem and the only symptom you're going to have is maybe a headache, maybe achy joints, maybe your joints are going to ache. Um, you can have other symptoms that are not related to digestion. And I think that's kind of important because a lot of people think oh well if i have a gut issue aren't i gonna have a gut issue now if you have an autoimmune to gluten like if or if you have what's called celiac then mm -hmm. it, it doesn't take any gluten you're you're gonna have a, a a symptom right away you're gonna be doubled over with pain because this means mm -hmm. that you have an antibody you have a system in your gut that you actually a, a, attack gluten um and it's it's sort of a different type of pathology than somebody who has a gluten sensitivity who they just have the perfect storm they have this bad bacteria they just ate they have uh zonulin storming so they've got this like perfect storm that creates this opening but they can reverse that also now if they have a certain genotype which we're going to talk about then they're more prone to that so when I get tested, when I get my patients tested and they have this gene, then I'm probably recommending to go gluten-free. But even so, then, even if you have the Z gene and you don't have any gut bacteria, there's, there's, there could be, you know, 80% of the population that have it with gluten and 20% that never have a problem and they're this genotype because so, you have to have a perfect story. Yeah. What? What purpose then, why would anyone risk, like, other than for taste or palate, what purpose does gluten, uh, or what benefit, or what, what well, why, why bother to have gluten if well, there's a... Gluten is, um, yeah, gluten tastes good. It has a lot more fiber. It is a protein. It's a protein in, in wheat. Um, it's, it, it's like any food. It's got a lot of uh, the higher protein foods that are in grains are going to come from the wheat. It's going to have a much higher protein content. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, not sure. That's not a problem. It also has a much higher fiber content. So when you look at um, some of these fibers, the brands, they're going to be from the wheat plant and they're going to have really a lot of fiber. So a lot of insoluble fibers. Mm -hmm. So, Oh, and also, too, one of the things we're not considering is that wheat in America is different than wheat in Europe. How we farm it, we have really farmed down the grain, the wheat grain, 
So it's almost a different variety, as interesting as that is. And so there's been some studies that say, yeah, there's more probability of gluten issues, wheat from America, than you look at gluten issues, wheat in Europe. Just thought I'd throw that out there. So answer to your question, yeah, I mean, some people exactly say that. But then some people say, look, I can't live on a gluten-free diet. I don't get all the fiber I need. There, is there any reason I should do it? Um, I do like to get people tested for this gene. And if I see that, then I just say, look, you got to be extra careful. Keep a clean gut. And, you know, everything could be fine. Mm-hmm. But not necessarily. Not necessarily, if you have a certain genotype. So there are certain genes that I'm going to talk about with you guys that um, that I think are, are important. And they're not a big array. I mean, I know 23andMe, you get all these genes, and half of them are sort of um, anecdotal in a sense. Well, we found that when 5,000 people had this gene, they didn't do well with carbs. But the ones I'm going to refer to to you guys are actually bona fide plasma, you know, they've done studies on it. We have clinical trials and they actually show these, these different outcomes from the clinical trials. So it's not like anecdotal or you're like, oh, all these people, this is what we observed. It's, it's going to be much more clinical than that. I mean, it is to me, um, I think the more and more you guys attend my live streams, I try to bring information for you that I think super, super important that you can use. I think you're going to come to the conclusion, especially when I bring the studies, everything I'm talking about as far as, and I do say, oh, this is the Holy Grail. You're going to start to see that what I'm referring to here, when I talk about learn how to eat, mm-hmm. that it can actually regulate your appetite because you've already done it. I know you have because you've already said, I can't believe it. I don't even eat. I'm down to, what are you down to your high school weight right now? Oh, uh, maybe. Yeah. Right. Or college. And- it's college. <laughs> You're down in your college weight. And when you came to see me, it was like, I can't lose weight. Yeah. And it's been so easy because what happens? You don't have the appetite, do you? Yeah, no. No. Nope. Right. And but how you- does one how does one know? What are the markers for um, you know, uh absent, you know, distended stomach or diarrhea? And how, what are the markers for either a um, you know, a not yet reversed bad gut biome or what are the markers of a good reversed um, so believe it or not short of a blood test symptoms symptoms you're Mm going to start feeling better um the foggy brain is gone the Mm -hmm. fatigue is gone Mm -hmm. and you just start having energy you feel better right um and I don't know if you can necessarily put a finger on it, but it's just it's just a better feel. You feel lighter. You feel you just don't have that sluggish feel when that gut is off. Yeah, you can have you can have gut issues for sure, but you can also have issues that aren't related to the gut. Headaches, fatigue, all of that can come from the gut. From mm-hmm. come, come from these yeast overgrowth, these bacteria overgrowth, or you have addiction to food. Maybe you're finding that you're just wanting certain foods all the time. That can also be a gut issue. So a lot of times with my patients that have IBS, gut issues, I find they have these huge, they're huge finicky eaters. I don't, I don't eat any of that. I forget about food sensitivity. They just have these, you know, palates that they only like mono foods, certain foods. So I just, I, I observe that. I see in the field. So any other questions? I love all these questions, guys. Hopefully um, this was helpful and you can understand now when I talk about fiber being the magic bullet, it truly is because it hits the mark on so many levels for regulating your appetite. Making sure that you're using the fiber, not just to balance the carbs and do some of the balancing act, But it is one of the biggest satiety bullets you have out there because it hits it on so many levels. Anyways, 
Um, okay, I don't see any more chats. Anybody want to? Uh, I have one more. Yeah. <laughs> Mushrooms are good for fiber and gut biome, right? Yeah, I mean, we can look at mushrooms. Uh, I can kind of look into the plant itself. It doesn't have a ton of fiber. I, I think a cup of mushrooms might be three grams of fiber. Let me see if I have them on my chart to see how much soluble or insoluble it is. I might have included them in there. They're kind of like, you know, they, you know, they say some of it antiviral or I, so I oh, just yeah. want if they had benefits for the gut biome that another kind of vegetable you know doesn't i know in the so, variety i'm going to tell you the biggest gut microbiome as far as creating good bacteria because remember the insoluble help clean the gut so that you don't want to discount those but the soluble ones okay if you look here it looks like apple's got a pretty good soluble i'm just looking at my chart here um it looks like black beans are almost four for half a cup. That's amazing, right? Because a cup of beans would almost give you eight soluble. Um, and if I look, yeah, beans are usually high. And I think, did I not put, oh, yeah, there it is. Vasillum husks, vasillum seeds, two mm -hmm. tablespoons is seven grams of soluble fiber. Mm -hmm. So these fibers that are soluble, they do help create... They're really good at creating some of the bacteria. And the insolubles are re really good at cleaning your gut, getting the sludge, getting those cracks, taking mm -hmm. down the toxins. But anyways, the truth is that most fibers have a mix of both. So you're going to get both soluble and insoluble when you're eating fibers. And if you think about eating four cups of vegetables, you're probably getting at least seven or eight grams of soluble fibers easily. For sure. Got it. Okay. Any other questions? I love it, guys. Good job. Thank you, Myrna. Okay. Hopefully this was helpful. And I'll see you guys next week.